Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Lisa Mendez, I'm the Programs Director for the Miami Book Fair, and uh, we're very glad to have you all here today. Um, just to note that this event is live, and uh, both our author and our interviewer will be live um, right on your screen in just a few minutes. I know that some of you were uh, here once before to see these authors, um, to see uh, this author and his interviewer speak, but unfortunately there were some um, difficulties with uh, the tech, but we're all back here today and we'll get started. And um, it's going to be a wonderful conversation. Um, again, you know, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, on behalf of Mitchell Kaplan uh, and the rest of the staff at Books and Books, and on behalf of all of us at the Miami Book Fair, um, we're very excited uh, to be able to present um, these, uh, this author, uh, Anthony De Palma, this evening uh, to discuss his new book, The Cubans, Ordinary Lives in Extraordinary Times, published by Viking. A portrait of modern Cuba through the evolution of the Guanabacoa neighborhood over the past 20 years, the Cubans situates the reader across the harbor from old Havana to observe the challenges and optimism of contemporary Cubans in the face of the, re the new regime. The New York Times raved in his thoroughly researched and reported book, replete with human detail and probing insight, the Palma renders a Cuba few tourists will ever see. You're bound to emerge from the Palma's big hearted account with a deeper understanding of a storied island. Anthony De Palma is the author of The Man Who Invented Fidel, and here, a biography of the new American continent. He spent 22 years as a, reported and, as a reporter and foreign correspondent for the New York Times, serving as bureau chief in Mexico and Canada. In 2009, in Columbia University, the Columbia University awarded him, excuse me, Columbia University awarded him the Maria Morse Cabot Award for Distinguished International reporting. His interest in Cuba is both professional and personal. He's married to Miriam Rodriguez, who was born in Cuba and came to the U.S. after the 1959 revolution. He first visited Cuba in 1979 during the brief thaw in the U in U.S. and Cuba relations during the administration of Jimmy Carter and has been back many times since then to report and visit family. To moderate tonight's conversation with Anthony is Tim Paget the America's editor for Miami's NPR affiliate WLRN covering Latin America, the Caribbean, and their key relationship with South Florida. Paget has reported on Latin America for more than 30 years, including for Newsweek at its Mexico City Bureau Chief and, as time, and for time as its Latin America and Miami Bureau Chief. He has interviewed more than 20 heads of state. To, uh, throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking on the Ask a Question button on the screen. You'll see it right on the bottom. And you can find the Cubans for purchase at Books and Books. There's a link also here. Please, we welcome all of your questions. Just make sure, again, you put them on the uh, Ask a Question link so that Tim Paget can find them. And I am going to now bring our guests up to the screen. Uh, first, I will bring Mr. Tim Paget up to the screen and Hi. Mr. Anthony De Palma. And there he is. Hey. Welcome, you both. Thank you, Lisette. And, and thanks, as always, to Books and Books. Uh, these, these book presentations are really one of Miami's most important traditions, and it's always a pleasure to do these, especially uh, when when I can uh, uh, do it with with uh, such a good friend and, and colleague as Anthony De Palma. Uh, it's it's a real treat uh, to 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 help him present this book. And I should notice, uh, aside from the two books that Lisette mentioned, uh, Anthony is also the author of of a book uh, titled City of Dust, uh, which is, is also a, an excellent read. Uh, about the the, the 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 tragedy and the drama of the cleanup of the World Trade Center. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you very much to all of you for being here uh, to to hear about what is really an important book, and 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 I I really 
do feel that this is a very important book uh, in, in the chronicling of Cuba. I've been covering Cuba since, since 1990. And I, I, I will tell, as, as I tell everyone, I, one of the most important things uh, about the normalization of relations with Cuba five years ago for, for me as a journalist uh, was that it, I think it finally gave us a chance to engage in this whole Cuba drama, not just the Cuban regime or the Cuban exiles, but instead the perhaps most forgotten group in this whole saga, which is the Cubans living on the island of Cuba itself. And that is what makes this book so important because it is not just uh, a masterfully told narrative of Cubans on the island. It is really one of the first that, that I know of to Im embed itself really with a, a community of, of, of Cubans, not just in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the tradition of travel writing where we often get nice charming vignettes of, of Cubans, but to actually chronicle the lives of Cubans and more importantly, chronicle their trajectory from uh, sort of loyal Cuban revolutionaries to their estrangement from the revolution and their metamorphosis into something uh, much more historically important, not only for Cuba, but for uh, Cuba-US relations. And uh, it's, there, there are just uh, a number of compelling profiles of, of Cubans here. The, the kind of profile that, as I said before, has really escaped us uh, all, through all these years um, as we watch uh, the, the Cuba the drama unfold. And so, Anthony, I guess the first question really that, 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 that comes to my mind, and I think the minds of anybody who would pick up this book is, as you, as I said, embed yourself with a community of Cubans, why Guanabacoa? Why this particular community? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking Tim for doing this, not once, but twice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was the first was just a rehearsal. The first was just a rehearsal. You know, uh, in these 40 plus years that I've been going to Cuba, often with Miriam, my wife, we've sort of come up with our own approach. You know, it's a different mindset to be there. And we've coined the phrase, Cuba siempre una aventura. And it, it works uh, almost in any situation. And it certainly worked when we tried to do this the first time. And hopefully, uh, we've got that all out of the way, and this will be a, a good, uh, a good uh, cast, whatever. We are, we are practicing. Or... We are practicing resolver. <laughs> uh, so, listen. If if things had been different, uh, this wouldn't have been the first instance, right? Um, back in in the 1960s, uh, an anthropologist named Oscar Lewis, uh, very famously, had done a, a a look at the culture of poverty in Mexico. And the book that resulted from that, Children of Sanchez, became a classic anthropological study done in a very different way by looking at, in that case, the four members of an individual family. In 1968, Fidel invited Oscar Lewis to come to Cuba to do the same thing, to talk to the Cuban people, the real Cuban people down on the street, and find out what their life is like. Do for Cuba what he did for Mexico. And Lewis uh, was interested, but he said uh, to Fidel, you know, if I talk to people that intimately, they're gonna complain. They're gonna let me know what they really feel. And Fidel said, don't worry about it. I know exactly, because they've already told me. I know exactly where things stand. You just go ahead and talk to anybody you want. So he did. And Oscar Lewis's method was similar to the one that, uh, that I've used. You basically embed yourself in a community. Uh, he started uh, intimately interviewing these people and living with them and, and recording their desires, their complaints, their uh, sense of the revolution. And when a draft of it got back to Fidel, it turned out that Fidel didn't like what he heard, stopped the project, accused Oscar Lewis, this famous American anthropologist, of being a spy for the CIA and, <laughs> and had him uh, kicked out of the country. And so that project was scuttled. And since then, 
it's been uh, impossible for anyone uh, to do it on the same scale. So those people, the, the ordinary people that you uh, you frame so beautifully, uh, have basically been uh, silent, silenced in their own country and silenced here as well. So uh, I had this opportunity to to do the book based on my knowledge there, and I thought it made sense, as you know, as a journalist. Even if we spend a couple of years embedded in a community, we're talking about accelerating this process of gaining confidence and uh, yeah. gaining intimacy with people. So you've got to do it in a way that accelerates it. Uh, what I had was my experience, my New York Times background, but most importantly, this connection to family. Um, although Miriam left, in the 1960s and her family who never owned any property there had all been gone by the early 1970s so in all the years that we went back we never really uh, found anybody who knew her or knew of the family because there had been such turnover but Wanabakoa made sense from that point of view uh, so at least I could say I had some connection to it and with Cubans and any other Latins, any connection like that uh, all of a sudden blossoms or can blossom into something more. It also became logistically possible to do it. It was uh, accessible, but not really well known. It was on the other side of the old Havana that lots of American tourists and, and others know about, but very few uh, Americans uh, were ever there or knew much about it, although people in Miami probably recognize the name Wanabacoa more than anybody else in the States. And so for that reason, it was, it, it sort of had uh, a whole pot of possibilities that I thought would work. And in the end it did. And the protagonist, Caridad Limonta, uh, a strikingly impressive woman, obviously, but also one with uh, again, I use that I use that word metamorphosis uh, earlier, and I think it it, it sort of applies to her. Um, why did she turn out to be the focus uh, amongst all of the, the the compelling characters you have uh, in this narrative? Why did she turn out to really be, as I said, the protagonist focus? Yeah, of, of this story? Uh, I mean, she was an extraordinary woman. And although the subtitle of the book is Ordinary Lives in Extraordinary Time, these are not necessarily uh, ordinary people right. uh, in, in that their, their set of characteristics, and in Caridad's case, her courage, her intelligence, her sensitivity to things really uh, makes made her an extraordinary person. And I was extraordinarily lucky to find her. In full disclosure, uh, when I started this project, um, one of the first people I spoke to was Tim. And um, I asked him, knowing that uh, he's been doing this for a long time and, and based there in Miami, if he knew anybody from Wanabagoa, because I really was starting with nobody. And uh, you said, well, yeah, there's this person and she's actually a, a cuenta propista and I've interviewed her. But she's a pretty hardline uh, party uh, partidista, uh, and she, you know, she feels uh, in in that particular way. And I said that's fine. I actually, I started out without wanting to either write a book that apologized for the regime or simply bashed the regime. That wasn't my goal. My goal was to find out how people there were living. And so someone who was a party member or uh, loyal to the party, but also a cuenta propista, seemed like fair game. And I, yeah. I asked to, uh, to be introduced, and you did. And I don't know if, 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 if I would really have described her as hard line at that time when I first met her, uh, but she was at that time still um, revolutionary, a loyal yeah. revolutionary, um, even, if, um, even if she disapproved a lot of, of what the revolution had become, she still was very loyal to the spirit of it. Um, and, and yet uh, she became, as I said before, very, uh, estranged from it. Her trajectory was, was beginning to take place 
in, in that regard. And, and I think from the time I introduced her to you to the time then that you started spending much more intimate time with her uh, through the next three or four years, you really saw a striking change uh, in, in her attitude toward the revolution. And, and starting with the fact that she became a, a, an entrepreneur, a quinta propista, as you said, when in fact, before that, she had been a very, I guess the best word is privileged, um, high level um, regime official, government official. Tell, tell us yeah. more about that. Yeah, and, absolutely. And that change that took place in her. Um, Gotti, it's one of those those things that sometimes happen to to writers and and journalists. You you just end up somehow finding the right people, and she was right right from the beginning. When I found out that she had been born in the city of Guantanamo in December of 1956, three weeks after Fidel arrived on the Granma with the 81 rebels to begin the fighting part of the revolution. So her trajectory in life paralleled the trajectory of the revolution itself. So right. she was being raised uh, from Guantanamo. They moved, her, her mother moved her and her twin sister, uh, Esperanza, to the sugar mill town of Takaho in the province of Olguin and lived there in very humble surroundings. And I wanted to, to capture that in the book. So the book begins after the prologue with her grandmother working in uh, a how, the house of the doctor in the sugar town. And uh, then her mother takes over and as a 13 year old is basically the servant in the town who makes the mistake of putting a candy bowl too close to the fire on the stove to get rid of the ants and ants are everywhere when you're in a, in a tropical setting like that. The bowl cracks and the mother is admonished by the, the doctor's wife. And she vows then that be, that happened because she was a girl and because she wasn't educated and that was never going to happen to her again. And that spirit she sort of transfers to her daughters who grow up in the sugar mill town and then in Havana do well enough that Caridad with her spirit of adventure goes, uh, uh, qualifies for a scholarship when Cuba was part of the Soviet bloc and was taking full advantage of that. So she, along with thousands of other Cuban students are sent to Soviet universities, in her case, the one in Kiev in Ukraine, where she gets a degree in uh, what's called economic engineering, meets her future husband, who's also studying there in engineering, and comes back uh, and moves into the uh, Ministry of Light Industry that basically produces clothing and, and other, uh, not heavy industry, light industry. And she quickly makes her way up the ladder, uh, moving from one position of authority to another, gets her break in the early 1990s where Cuba is trying to promote women and um, African, Afro-Cubans uh, into right. positions of authority. She becomes manager and then director of a, an aluminum plant, later on director of the import-export clothing part of the ministry, Puntex, and then uh, later becomes vice minister of light industry for the entire country. Right. And when I met her, I remember one of the reasons she often told me that she was still a loyal revolutionary was the fact that in the Batista era, she couldn't have imagined a black woman like herself in Cuba having risen to the heights that you just described. Sure. Uh, keep in mind, the Batista era is the 1950s. Yeah. Uh, so it's not just in Cuba where a black woman wouldn't have had that opportunity. I dare say that in our country in the 1950s that it would have been right. uh, rare uh, as well. But yes, she was, she was in the right place. Um, and um, they obviously needed to show that in a socialist society, uh, an egalitarian society, that it really covered everybody. That was for her, being a black woman, a big part of what the revolution stood for. It was, it was a central promise.
for her, mm-hmm. equality. When, they, when she went over to Ukraine, filled with the spirit of the revolution in, uh, in the early 1970s, she's on board this old Russian uh, cruise ship that's taking her and 2,000 other Cuban students. And they all march on board. She, it, this scene is the, all marching on board the, uh, the ship, each of them carrying the same uh, cardboard suitcase one either beige or blue, all of them wearing the same clothes, all of them even, she says, wearing the same underwear that says made in Cuba. And for her, it was a point of pride that yes, she was equal to all the others. Coming from her little sugar mill town as a black woman, being equal to all the others really meant that the revolution seemed to be fulfilling that central promise. And it was the central promise as it played out that really was the turning point for her metamorphosis. Right. She has the revolution in the palm of her hands. But then after 2011, after Raul suddenly says, we're going to let entrepreneurs begin to thrive, if you can call it that, uh, in Cuba, and particularly uh, when Obama normalizes relations with Cuba and we start elevating the profile of the Quinta Propista in Cuba, Again, she's got the revolution in the palm of her hands, but yet decides, no, I'm going to pivot to the yeah. private sector in Cuba. Yeah. Why? I, I, just to go back uh, uh, and reset a little bit, I would never say thrive. No, no. That's, that's, I, I, said, I said if that – I put that in quotes, believe yeah. me, in Cuba. I, and I don't, even, I don't even think that was they, – they would even say that because they, they insist on yeah. having a rich country without rich people. So they don't want you. You cannot thrive if your license is to yeah. clean spark plugs or to peel fruit. I should have said, open the door a little bit more of a crack. Yeah. A crack, a crack mm-hmm. to uh, to capitalism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, actually, her her moment of of uh, illumination occurs slightly before then, and it happens in a, a counterintuitive way, because you would imagine that with this promise of uh, equality there's an instance where somebody just doesn't get what they think they ought to get. Um, in Cotty's case, it was just the opposite. Her mother, the woman who, who put the sugar bowl next, the, the candy bowl next to the stove to get rid of the ants, uh, came down with cancer. And living in Wanabacoa with Cotty, she was supposed to go to the uh, local hospital called Miguel Enriquez or La Benefica, which really isn't all that uh, beneficent to any of the people who have to go there. It's a, a middling kind of dowdy place, not very well equipped, even back then. Now it's, it's even less so. But with the system that they have, yes, there's universal health care. Everybody goes to the, the consulta on the corner and then up to the polyclinic. And then if that doesn't serve, then they have to go to the hospital, but not the hospital they want to go to, the hospital that they're assigned. In this case, La Benefica, because they lived in Wanabacoa. As soon as they get there, someone's already made the phone call to say, listen, the mother of the vice minister cannot be taken care of there. She has to go to the big central uh, well-equipped hospital in Havana, Los Hermanos Almejeras, the big one that, that shows up in Michael Moore's film, Sicko. And there she gets what Gotti considers very good coverage. Uh, and when she's released home, when there's nothing else they can do for her, at home she gets the wheelchair, she gets the adult uh, diapers, she gets the oxygen tank, and everything else that she needs right away where everybody else would have to wait that sort of dawns on Gotti that it's not the way it's supposed to be if we are all equal we should all have equal access to this but in fact we're all equal but some if you're the vice minister's mother are actually more equal than others right and it was her orwellian her, moment yeah uh, with her sense of justice it's it it plants a seed and then in years to come as she's become more aware of how much privilege she had enjoyed for the earlier years of her life what happened to her mother 
and then what happens to her when she gets sick, uh, it is really an awakening. And uh, she comes out of all that realizing that uh, things are not as they, as she thought they were. So she goes in and another direction. Goes in another direction, becomes a very dynamic entrepreneur, um, as, as we both witnessed. And, and yet we come to the end of the book, and, and one of the most striking quotes from her that, uh, that you highlight is that she says, the revolution is lost. Right. Right. Now, and she, she's the, uh, she and her husband, uh, Jesus Fidel, are the parents of uh, just one child. She, she suffered many miscarriages. So for them, this child was uh, super important. Uh, born in 1991, right in the heart of the uh, special period. period. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, she and her husband go through what's essentially the, the personal drama or the, the passion play that almost every Cuban family today goes through. And that is, what can we do to keep the kid here with us in Cuba while they are increasingly desperate to get out? And I think in part, that may be wh what some of that change that occurred between the time that you saw her and the time that I was uh, down there working with her because she had um, her son um, who she, uh, she made sure he had the best education she could pay for which wasn't much, but it was, it was those special classes that helped him prepare to take the test to get into the Design Institute in Havana, which he then graduated yeah. from. She helped yeah. him get a license as uh, a cuenta propista, as a designer, brought him into her company, uh, sponsored and was willing to let him go to uh, FIU for a program in uh, 2016 uh, for young Cuban entrepreneurs, a result of the Obama opening. And he then sees the United States fully for the first time as an adult. Uh, FIU gives him a credit card during the 45 days that he's there, and he can't believe it, that he's actually got yeah. money. Um, he comes back and it becomes increasing. He, he at first thinks, well, you know, I was with other Cuban entrepreneurs at FIU and they were making connections with uh, American businessmen and maybe, you know, and they seemed to be happy and some of them had, you know, nice watches and they all had iPhones. So he thinks maybe I could do it in Cuba. So he comes back all filled with uh, ambition. Caridad, with her expertise, actually helps him get a business loan. Uh, almost unheard of. She gets a business loan. They sign a lease for uh, a space for a workshop for both her business as the seamstress and a clothing manufacturer and his business designing, basically he was designing uh, merchandising, uh, advertising, like tote bags. Tote that bags, was a big right. thing in, in Cuba, if you have a company name on it. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, they thought they were going to, she thought, Caridad thought she was going to keep him. But while people say that Cuba is sort of stuck in a time warp and things don't change, for the people who live there down at this level out on the street, life really is so unpredictable. It changes almost every day. So the regulations that you set up your business and get your loans and you have your business plan to work by change from one day to the next. And all of a sudden, you can't do what you did before. You can't do it the way you did before. The wholesale market that they promised never materializes. You, any of your income, you have to put in a bank and convert it. You know, we've, they've got this crazy system of uh, uh, convertible dollars, and convertible pesos and Cuban pesos. You put in the convertible pesos that are convertible to the dollar. But when you take it out, you take out only Cuban pesos, which you can't use to buy anything. Oh, eventually, no, eventually it's so frustrating that at the end mm -hmm. of the book, uh, she loses him and uh, her yeah. son, her only son leaves because of her health condition. She doesn't have that option. So she's she's got her family sort of blown apart. And it's a repeat of so many Cuban families that the politics and 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 uh, this system sets up such a way that, you know, we think about things on this universal level of governments and 
and uh, naval blockades and, and uh, uh, all, all of that, Havana and Washington. But actually down on the street, th those actions by these, pe these players affect people like yeah. kids and families and split them apart in, uh, in ways that are very difficult for the individuals involved. And yet on balance, the story of her estrangement with the revolution is positive in, in many ways, as opposed to one of the other central dramas that you write about in the story, uh, these families who were involved in this tugboat tragedy uh, going yeah. back to, to 1994. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that more tragic uh, sure. facet of the story of Guanabacoa. Yeah, um, Wanabakoa, essentially a a working class or what would have been considered a working class community before the revolution. Then it becomes a, a, a sprawling community with an ancient core. The core of the community goes back to the 1540s, almost as old as Havana itself. And um, I think now somewhere around 100,000 people uh, during the the special period, the nadir of the special period in 1994, Four. people in Wanabakoa are, many of them are desperate to get out in whichever way. 1994, there are more hours in the day without electricity than there are right. with electricity. Um, there is very little food. People are attempting to make food out of whatever they can find. The conditions are, are, are terrible. Uh, in Wanabakoa, the family of a man uh, named Jorge Garcia, a very noble, um, very passionate uh, person who uh, had a sort of an artistic bent. He, he grew up in Wanabacoa. He supported Fidel in the early part of the revolution against Batista. His family included people who fought in the mountains with him. His uh, grandmother kept a sign on the door uh, after 1959, after January 1959, saying, Fidel, this is your house. You're welcome here. Um, like many other families, after the turn towards communism, they started to see things differently. And he struggled through that, went to uh, Angola with the army, came back, struggled to make ends meet. Basically, uh, he was a, uh, he gave parties, quinceañeras, uh, and he was, because of his voice, he would narrate little biographies of the girls. He had a large family and uh, many relatives in Wanabacoa. In 1994, the, the spring of 1994, they organized what seemed to them to be a foolproof escape. Uh, what they were going to do is one of his brother-in-law was one of the officials of the port of Havana and had access to uh, many sites in there and knew about an old tugboat. How old? We don't really know, uh, but it was not one of the newer ones. And it was called the Trece de Marzo, like m many uh, aspects of, of the Cuban history and revolution leading up to it. The uh, regime had taken control of that date. 13th of March was the date that the uh, students had tried to assassinate Batista. Trece de Marzo had been uh, completely redone in the months leading up to uh, July of 1994, when 68 individuals from Wanabacoa crammed on board the tugboat. 68 individuals, including Garcia's brother-in-law, who was an official of the port, a skipper, and then adults, men, women, and children, and infants, all on board. The idea was that they were gonna take this renovated tugboat and get as far as they could towards Florida. If they got out into international waters, US Coast Guard would pick them up and give them the choice of coming or going back. Or they even thought if they had enough fuel, they could make it all the way. On the 13th of July, 1994, they left in the middle of the uh, madrugada. It was three o'clock in the morning. Everything was dark. They thought they were gonna be able to slip out through that narrow bottleneck underneath El Morro Castle uh, without being seen. But before they got there, they saw lights behind them coming at them and they were two brand new uh, steel hulled tugboat, tugboat combination, tugboat, fireboat uh, chasing them. 
they got seven miles out and the other tugs then joined by a third uh, surrounded it and tried to stop it by basically ramming it and shooting these water cannons until the Trece de Marzo sank in the pitch dark night. Of the 68 people aboard, 37 didn't survive. 31 did, uh, including the, one of the survivors was his daughter, Garcia's daughter, Ma, Maria Victoria. But among those who died were 14 members of his family, including his son, Joel, Maria Victoria's husband, and Maria Victoria's son, his uh, Garcia's grandson, Juan Mario. And the, the, after, the aftermath is as tragic yeah. as the event itself. Yeah. Well, it, it sort of triggers in that summer of 1994 a whole bunch of events, including the, uh, the kidnapping and hijacking of the little lanchita that goes between Regla and Guanabacoa and Havana. That's that little uh, ferry boat, it's a flat bottom ferry boat, uh, is hijacked three, four, even five times. Uh, some of them make it out to international waters, some of them don't. Uh, and then in August of 1994, there's a rumor that, and imagine August in Havana, it's piping hot, yeah. there's no food, there's no gas, people are desperate. They've heard about the tugboat, they've heard about the ferry boat, and then they hear a rumor that maybe there are boats coming from Miami, as in Mariel. So they amass on the waterfront, there's some pushing and shoving, uh, there's somebody gets hurt, uh, and all of a sudden there are thousands of people on the Malecon in Havana shouting what had never been said in public before or since. Yeah. Abajo Fidel and Libertad. Fidel, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, for Garcia, at that point, he's home trying to get his fam the rem remnants of his family together. And he basically, uh, he and uh, Maria Victoria are uh, put upon by the rapid response brigades who show right. up outside the house, screaming at them as traitors and uh, gusanos. And he loses his job. She loses her job. It's, uh, it, it, life becomes unbearable for them. By 1999, during the Pope's visit in uh, 1999, the American embassy hears about his story and arranges for him to come to the United States as refugees. And he ends up in Miami, where he lives now. But by then, he's already in his 50s. Um, yeah. he, he tries to make do uh, as a watchman, uh, trains dogs. His wife, who was ill, and that was the reason he didn't get onto the tugboat, in 1994, uh, is working in a nursing home, but uh, becomes increasingly frail and eventually dies. And he now realizes that uh, while the American way of life is uh, is different from in Cuba, the American way of death uh, for yeah. someone who doesn't really have the money is just as difficult. But despite all that, that's, he that's, has that's perhaps I just want to say that's I just want to say that's perhaps one of the most poignant moments of your book when this man realizes that he's how much he has to pay for a funeral in the yeah. United States for his wife. And you really get the sense that this is a man caught between two worlds. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, back in, in Cuba, they never received a death certificate for any of the members of his family. The government never, never acknowledged that they had died. The only thing they did do was to remove all of them immediately from the list of the libreta, which gives them access to subsidized food. So although they, they're they not there anymore, uh, no death certificates, but they're not allowed to get the three eggs per month that they're allotted. So that, that goes aside. He comes here and he makes his life work seeking justice for those who died. So he has mm -hmm. continued to speak out. He's written a book about it. He, uh, he has appeared before an international commission uh, for the prosecution uh, for crimes against humanity of the Castro regime, uh, appeared before them several times, appeared before the Organization of American States. He knows it's a long shot, 
but uh, he feels he absolutely has no choice and he has vowed to his son and the others that he'll never, never stop seeking justice. And I believe him. But you also capture perhaps a more quiet, but just as powerful means of resistance in Guanabacoa. Um, and a lot of it often has to do with religion, or, or I should say the resuscitation of religion in a, in a community like Guanabacoa. And um, if I could ask you to read a passage uh, in the book of, again, one of these quieter moments of, of resistance and defiance on the part of Guanabacoans when they decide that on August 15th, which is, as you and I Catholics know, is the, uh, the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, and this statue of Mary has been in this church uh, under the revolution, kept away for so many years, and they decide to bring it out for a procession. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the characters who's involved in this scene is Maria del Carmen. And for me, she represents the old traditional Cuba. Uh, she's living in a house that her great grandmother, who came from Spain, purchased in 1897. Uh, she's devoted to uh, Spanish dance, uh, classical Spanish dance. And she is a devout Catholic living across the street from the large Catholic compound known to anybody uh, who knows Guanabacoa as Los Escolapios, the Escolapios uh, priest. Uh, and Armando, Armandito is the historian from the museum in Guanabacoa. <laughs> Armandito joined Mari at the rear of La Parroquia, the, uh, the main church in Guanabacoa, just minutes before the new Bishop of Havana, Juan de la Caridad Garcia Rodriguez ended the Holy Day Mass. From the pulpit, a priest then asked the people, should we take her out or keep her in? The rain had lightened considerably, but the skies were still threatening and the streets were soaked. A procession around the interior seemed prudent, but the overwhelming response was go out. The 338 year old statue dressed in fine clothes and a wig of human hair, metal rays of grace emanating from her back, was rolled along on a large cart and lowered down the church's main stairs. Mari and Armandito had rushed out to be in the park when the statue emerged. By the time they got there, the rain had stopped. A local band started to play. The statue on its rolling throne was mobbed. Bishop Garcia walked solemnly behind it, wisps of incense lingering around him as the entourage passed. Ambling up Jose Marti Street toward the museum, Mari put her disappointment behind her. The old streets were not strung with colored lights the way they had been before 1959, and the storefronts weren't decked out with fancy displays. Memories of the feast of her youth were so strong that she could smell the sweet churros and delectable little hamburgers called fritas that were sold at food stands around the park nearly until daybreak, though not one was there this day to tempt her. But for a few moments, as the Virgin swayed through the street, the band played familiar hymns and a clergyman swung his silver thurible. Wanabakoa again rose to the glory of her past. The band played joyfully, though slightly off key as the procession slowly passed in front of the mus municipal museum. The Virgin was turned a block later, coming out on Maximo Gomez Street near Arturo Montoto's studio. I Montoto is a famous artist who lives in Wanabacoa and one of the other characters. As it approached Pepe Antonio Street, Mari glimpsed her old friend Caridad Guerra slowly marching along with the procession. Caridad, now 71, was as tiny as she had been when she attended La Milagrosa 60 years earlier. And she walked as if she had borne the weight of the tugboat tragedy on her delicate shoulders for a quarter century. She lost four members of her family. They grazed each other's dry cheeks with kisses and chatted as they followed the procession back to the church. Bishop Garcia led prayers. The Virgin and her throne then were lifted up the stairs and carried back into the church. No more than half an hour had passed since she'd emerged, a far cry from the two hour procession through the streets that Mari remembered with such tenderness. Still the Virgin had come out, 
the rain had stopped and the tradition had continued for one more year. For 40 years, they didn't allow her out. Right, exactly. And so this, is a, this, this may seem a small triumph to, to most people, but for them, it, it was quite significant, especially when you consider that the, the, the quotidian struggles of, of Cubans like the people in Guanabacoa, uh, there's a, I, I've told you this before, I, I think you, you, you most brilliantly describe what happens to Cubans as they're trying to just get through uh, each day um, you, you call it, uh, and sometimes they have to do things that aren't always so ethical, that sometimes may not even be legal, and you, you call it uh, morality dis disfigured by necessity, mm -hmm. um, which is perhaps one other way of describing the word we often use, resolver, just yep. the, daily, the daily struggle to, to resolve problems. Um, as Cubans, and, and we're, uh, this, we, I'd like to get into the question uh, period now of, of, of our presentation here, and let me just launch the first with the first question, really. Um, as Cubans, people like those in Guanabacoa uh, have, as we said, become estranged from the revolution and are just going through this daily struggle um, to, uh, to, to resolver. But yet they're taking on new responsibilities, like we were, like we were discussing with Caridad. They're taking on new responsibilities, new outlooks. How would you describe the, the, the average Cuban today in terms of the new role that the average Cuban is playing as an engine of change in Cuba? And, 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 and how can we be best helping them uh, be en engines of change in ways that they have, have never been before? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know about uh, us helping them because uh, it, depending on how far down Main Street you go, they are increasingly isolated from the rest of the world. I mean, yeah. it, it, is, it is quite uh, astounding to consider how, how much they don't participate in the year 2020. Uh, you know, the, uh, they're, they're celebrating the fact that in some small parts of Havana, they're now getting 3G internet service, 3G, while the rest of the world is moving to 5G. Um, not everybody, you know, there are half a million, more or less half a million people who have taken out these licenses uh, that Raul allowed in 2011. Uh, I think that that number probably is outdated because like uh, Caridad's son, many of them have sort of given up and they've handed back the license or they've stopped paying for it. Uh, you, you cannot, to go back to the, um, the thrive question, you can't, you can't run a business when uh, the, the structure is set up to put obstacles in your way at every turn. I mean, they don't want anybody to be too successful. And so they build in uh, obstacles. There's no wholesale market. There's no easy way to get a loan. Uh, what I saw, uh, maybe the most striking part of it is, even if you wanted to do something as selling platanos and garlic on the street in a little cart, right? You'd yeah. have to have a cart. Well, maybe you could, you, there's no Home Depot to go to. So you'd have to scrounge some wood and maybe a few pieces of metal, uh, and then you'd need wheels. Again, there's no place to go for wheels. So you, you try to uh, resolve the problem. And the way they do that is in Havana and in Guanabacoa, which is the municipality of Havana, they collect the garbage in a, in a, a pretty um, unproductive way. They bring out these big dumpsters made out of a hard plastic that are on wheels and they're supposed to be picked up and dumped into a larger truck. Well, those wheels are more valuable to people as wheels on their cart than they are as wheels in the garbage. So on the corner of Caridad's house, uh, after she complained because people yes. were dumping garbage there, they brought in five canisters, brand new ones, and within the first week, all five had been tipped over, emptied of garbage, and the wheels stolen. Yeah. A few weeks after that, the canisters themselves disappeared. 
because people would would chew up the uh, grind up the plastic and melt it down and reuse it for the soles of sneakers and and uh, cheap toys. So uh, it's it's hard to say except from the point of view of either vision or or promise. Uh, the people who were taking out these licenses and thinking about a new way of Cuba, which is the old way, right? Cuba was very entrepreneurial before the revolution. Yes. The people to do that now, it's it's not going to happen because they're successful and they're making money, but it is going to happen because it sort of gives them the idea that they have some control over their lives, which I think is is part of the totalitarian system that is most difficult for Americans to understand. It right. might more, be more independence in, in many ways. Independence, as well. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, control. Yeah. So yeah. there might be food with the libretta, uh, mm -hmm. or you could go to uh, you know to some program and get food, but that still means you're reliant on the government to give it to you. Uh, many of them would like to say, even the son of the most strident communist that I talked to, would like to say, look, if they just left me alone and let me do my business, I'd be fine. Yeah. And that I think is is mostly the change that's happened in the last few years. Is not that that's ha not that they have that freedom, but that they now think more about having it. Yeah, and so, it's certain, if you can more of an expect expectation. Expectation. Ex so you leave for can the, be very dangerous to, to, to authoritarian regimes. Yeah. They don't like it. No. And related to that, here's, uh, we have a question from John McAuliffe. Um, and he asks, if, if the economic opening policies announced this summer are implemented, and that's a huge if, is it more than a crack? If, if it's more than a crack, would Caridad's son, for example, have had a better chance to fulfill his dream, uh, for example, ending li the limited list of Quinta Propista categories, the roles for small and, uh, enterprises, the use of the dollar, et cetera, the things that you were describing? If, if, if those policies are miraculously enacted as fully as we hope, do you think it would help retain, as John's asking, younger people like like Caridad's son on the well, other. Well, uh, I mean, the devil is in the details, right? Yes. So you, they promised to do away with the list and they've talked about allowing importing and exporting. Great. But if they're going to allow importing and exporting only through some government military operated import export company, then it's not going to work. But the bottom line to John's question, John's very good question is yeah, you know, anybody who's been to Cuba knows what the sun feels like, what the breeze feels like, what uh, the water is like. I mean, it is, it, there's a reason why Spain held on to it for 500 years. Exactly. It's, it's a very nice place to live. And Latins, Cubans are Latins, and Latins love to be around their family. So they don't leave lightly. They don't throw themselves in a raft lightly. They don't uh, m turn their backs on everything that they know and leave behind. If they had the choice, look, even Montoto, who had the choice, who the lived artist. outside, the artist, who lived outside Cuba for uh, more than a decade, came back because as an artist, as someone who, uh, who thrives on color and light, he felt that he couldn't work as well as he worked in Cuba anywhere else because of the sunlight that exists there. So, yes, if if all of that happened and uh, they were in, and and uh, Caridad's son was able to do business in the way he wants and have access to the material he needs and have freedom to use his his money that he made and invest it the way he wanted. Uh, yeah, I think he he and many others would probably come back, but those are a lot of ifs. And not and not just uh, the big things like being able to import and export, but the more mundane things, which I think are even more important, like access to the wholesale market in Cuba, which oh, sure. they seem to be prominent. Because frankly, that's how I met Caridad. She came to Miami yeah. to start to look for the wholesale goods that she needed to uh, to, to to run her business. And if right. that, I, I think if they were really to get access to whole, to a wholesale market in Cuba, that could really be a game changer. For, for people like Caridad and other entrepreneurs. Yeah, but you're talking about a centrally controlled economy that can't yeah. even provide enough toothpaste or toilet exactly. paper after exactly. 60 years. 
uh, for people to not have to wait online eight hours. Yeah. So the, the export part of it was important because in lieu of a wholesale market, if you could import yeah. your own material from Panama, mm -hmm. say, uh, then you could or, do or, what you, or from Hialeah. Well, then, you know, that's that that gets into the embargo. But Panama yeah. doesn't. Uh, you could you could do your business. Yeah, you could you could do it. Yeah. Um, another related question is the Biden campaign making a strong enough case to Cuban Americans that it will reverse the attacks by Trump and Rubio, Senator Marco Rubio, Florida, on remittances, immigration, reunion visas, flights to regional capitals, that sort of thing. Do you get the sense that the Biden campaign is making a strong enough case uh, that, that it will effectively reverse a lot of these changes that Trump has made? Well, uh, I'm going to ask answer briefly, and then I'd, I'd rather hear you answer that since you're right down there. Uh, yeah. The Biden campaign hasn't made much of a strong case about anything, frankly, other than that Donald Trump should not be president. But what they're going to do and how they're going to do it, I mean, he's he has said, Biden has said, he will restore a lot of the Obama opening. Uh, what that means and how far he can go and what happens when that promise comes up against the demands for some quid pro quo on the part of the Cubans for human rights or in political independence or just freedom of expression, he hasn't said. But what kind of a case is he making down there? You, you see yeah. it every day. Well, no, I think I, as good as that question is that I just read, I think the even more important question, at least in the Miami context, is, is he making a strong enough case that if he's president, he will be tougher with Cuba than Barack Obama was in terms of us getting something back from everything that we're giving in this normalization dance. And I think that's one of the reasons that Biden is struggling with, uh, with uh, Hispanics and the Latino vote in Florida is because perhaps he hasn't made a strong enough case that he'll do things, he'll, 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 he'll restore Obama's engagement policies, but uh, what will he do to, you know, as I said before, uh, uh, make sure that it's a two-way street this time. And I think that's what a lot of particularly Cuban, not just Cuban, but Venezuelan, Colombian voters, uh, they, they want to hear more of that as well. Another question, Anthony, what type of transformation, this is from uh, Bianca Sproul, Sproul I, I, I apologize if I'm, if I'm pronouncing that wrong. What type of transformation do you foresee in the Cuban government, a more gradual transition or a sudden power shift? Mm -hmm. Well, what we know is that Raul, um, who's been very quiet lately, had announced years ago that uh, in 2021, the year upcoming, he would step down as uh, head of the Communist Party in Cuba, which is the real power. Uh, of course, in 2018, he voluntarily stepped down as president uh, of the National Assembly, um, where there's some power, but until then, it had always been uh, either he or Fidel controlling both. <laughs> so right now you have Miguel Diaz-Canel as president, uh, you know, some apparatchik from Santa Clara who basically seems to be doing whatever it is that Raul and Machado and the other old guys from the mountains are telling him to do. Mm -hmm. And you have Raul still in charge of the Communist Party. Uh, and I, from all indications, very much in charge, not running day to day things, but nothing happens unless he sort of says, OK, next year he steps down as president of the party. He's already made it known back in 2018 during this earlier succession that his plan is for Diaz-Canel to take over as president of the Communist Party. So we'll go back to both of those positions, the head of the national, the president and the uh, head of the party being the same person. What that means is that for the first, really for the first time, there will be no Castro in charge. Uh, going all the, all the way back. What does that mean? Well, Raul will still be alive. Uh, let's assume Raul is still alive, although his tomb is already set up in uh, well, Segundo uh, Frente uh, next yeah. to Vilma. He's got his mm -hmm. her name on it and his name on it already. So it's only a, biology uh, cannot be denied. Yeah. Well, the other is the other historicals will be alive, still alive as well. No, uh, yeah, uh, but again, Machado is ninety. Uh, Ramiro is eighty-nine. Ramiro Valdez, yeah. yeah. 
so uh, and, and some of the others are there. So they're still there, and they've made the. I, I think the factor that uh, is going to be most important because those changes will happen. What we don't know is what role and how strong a role the military, those generals who are there, not the ones from the mountains, but the mm -hmm. ones who are in place now running yeah. Gaesa and having their hands in the pot for all, practically all of the money that comes in to Cuba from outside, all of those dollars and euros and Canadian dollars that come in from tourism, all those hotels and restaurants and other facilities are owned and operated by the military. Without uh, Raul there, uh, will they continue to be strong? I mean, they've got a lot going, uh, a, a lot at stake for them Take, to keep right. things, to keep things mm -hmm. the way they are. And yep. they're the only ones with guns and they're the only ones with a steady stream of income. So any mm -hmm. change that doesn't sort of happen gradually has to go mm -hmm. through them. Right. Is that going to happen? I, well, <laughs> I don't. I don't see that. Uh, the well, what happens in Washington, I think, will make a big difference in what happens down there. We have time for one la one last question, and, th and this is a, a nice one to end on. Um, Jacob asks, in your opinion, why is it important for these stories to be shared among the American public? Hmm. A very good question. Uh, and yes, that that was. Uh, foremost in my mind as I was doing this book. Uh, we have, uh, we, our government in Washington has had this policy for now 60 years. And basically, if you reduce it to its simplest form, the policy is to make things so difficult in Cuba that the people eventually rise up and demand change. And that's basically what the embargo does, right? You you uh, you, you constrict the amount of, of goods and money going in. The government doesn't have the money, but the people don't have any of the th uh, many of the things that they need. Uh, you get them so fed up that they uh, they will rise up the way it happens in other countries. And I think we that policy has been in place for so long. Nobody's ever bothered to ask, well, what does it mean for the people? who are actually down there who we are expecting to rise up. Exactly. So by talking to them and finding out from them, from them that they consider their greatest strength, the ability to adapt to any hardship. And you see it everywhere. So uh, Joseito, one of the characters in the book is, is repairing furniture using uh, rubber strips that he takes off of discarded tires because there's no wholesale market. But he can do that. Very cleverly cuts it without taking his fingers off. Uh, I've seen and you've seen incredible things. A motorcycle with a, uh, a plastic soda bottle in place of a gas tank because there are no gas tanks. Uh, those beautiful cars are basically Frankenstein cars with pieces from who knows what in there and somehow they keep them going. So that ability to adapt to any hardship, uh, to, to figure out a way to fry up plantain skins when there's no food and somehow make it palatable uh, is at the same time their greatest strength and right. um, the curse that condemns them to continuing with what they have. So if you wanna be if you want to be uh, judgmental, yes, it's a complacency. They become complacent. They don't want to go out there and fight. If you become more empathetic and you realize the daily struggles that are outlined in the book, you see that it's very difficult for them because they have so little that risking it by doing something as simple as writing the word libertad on a wall could end up with them losing just that. You see it in a different way. And I think it's important for the people in Washington uh, and the people who vote for the people in Washington to understand what this policy is. If we decide to go ahead with it, then let's go ahead with it knowing what the reality is on the ground. 
And if the reality on the ground moves us to vote in a different way or to demand, we can demand. They don't demand down there. They sort of right. accept. Uh, and mm -hmm. then they, you know, they complain inside, but they, they, they don't demand. Um, they don't go out in the street the way we saw it here after uh, George Floyd in May, people demanding change. They're not demanding change down there in large measure because they are so afraid of losing the little bit that they have. That's, I think, the, the central message that I wanted to get across. And that's why it's important for Americans to know that. But, no, it's an extraordinarily important message. And that's why this is an extraordinarily important book. Uh, again, Anthony De Palma, The Cubans, Ordinary Lives in Extraordinary Times. Uh, thanks for writing this book. Thanks for extracting these stories out of this community. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate it, and I'm sure everybody who, who, who's read it appreciates it. So congratulations, Anthony. Thank you. And thanks again uh, to Books and Books and the, and the Miami Book Fair for this presentation, uh, chan Thank this you chance both. to make this presentation. Thank you. Thank you both. That was really very interesting. I, I enjoy listening to you both as a Cuban-American, as a, as a Cuban born in Cuba. Huh? I'm growing up in America, oh. particularly, yeah, I was particularly um, interested in your conversation tonight. So thank you very much. Um, and I do apologize that I left your book out, Anthony, but uh, City of Dust, Illness, Arrogance, and 9-11, as well as The Man Who Invented Fidel, Castro Cuba, and Her uh, Herbert L. Matthews of the New York Times. I've uh, placed both links on the chat for anyone who is attending tonight to be able to purchase. Um, and of course, the book that uh, you discussed this evening is also uh, available for purchase on Books and Books. Uh, again, thank you so much. I look forward to uh, seeing this conversation again um, as part of Miami Book Fair online. Uh, which is happening November 15th through the 22nd, and uh, maybe having you back for um, a little bit of a different sure. take and uh, with some other um, interview, interviewer a little bit later on this year. Uh, if you guys need anything at all out in the audience, please feel free to be in touch with us at the Miami Book Fair or at Books and Books. And uh, thank you again for everyone who tuned in tonight, and we'll see you again soon. Have a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much.